night beat starts right now. It is a slight increase in COVID-19 cases compared to recent days, but health officials urge you to not let your guard down during a second wave of the coronavirus. There were 44 new cases since yesterday, but we have seen a rapid increase from just a week ago. And take a look at the numbers right now. 4,437 local cases of COVID-19. That's more than 1,000 cases since just last week. The death toll stands at 89 tonight when last week it sat at 78 and the number of people hospitalized at 187 tonight, nearly 100 more than this time last week. Just two weeks after bars were allowed to reopen, some are making the decision to shut down again. This weekend, nearly a dozen bar owners announced on social media pages they were going to play it safe in light of the second wave of infections. The night team's Patty Santos talks to some of them who say this was not an easy decision. The well on the north side. We thought that it was best to shut down to give our staff a chance to get tested, make sure they are all healthy. Brooks Pub on the southeast side. We started seeing things happening at other clubs and people testing positive and it was moving so fast that you have to make a choice. Just two of the nearly dozen San Antonio bars that announced on social media this weekend that they're shutting down again for a deep cleaning and the decision wasn't easy. It's been very difficult financially um, through this entire time. We are a family run business, so when we close, um, it directly affects us and our family and our bartenders, our entire staff. But as they watched the numbers increase, they didn't want to risk their workers or patrons health. A few bars announced they had customers or workers who tested positive. It was super alarming. The squeeze box uh, owner says he's watching the news on new infections daily to make his decision. At this rate, if these case numbers keep going up like this, I'm not hopeful that we're going to stay open for another week or two. His staff wear masks and are required to get tested weekly. Management at this bar is waiting for the test results for their staff to decide when they're going to reopen. But once they do, they say they're going to be more strict about their protocol. It's just not worth it to keep going through the opening, closing, opening, closing when it's just easier to make it right. Bar owners say they were eager to get back to business, but now they're forced to make a moral decision on whether to make a living or shut down. You can't fault anybody for whatever decision they make because people have to eat, people need jobs, and, you know, this is the times we're in right now. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. It concerns over COVID lead to a temporary closure at an adult daycare facility in Live Oak. City officials learned people with the illness were staying at this facility overnight. Police say they were actually staying in a back office. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with the city manager there about this issue. An unusual sight at the Council Oaks office building in Live Oak this afternoon. People dressed in full body PPE escorting individuals to transport vans. The Live Oak police chief says two people with COVID-19 were being housed at this building off Topperwine. The problem, the Live Oak city manager says this facility is not designated for that. The facility is more like a more like an adult daycare facility and not really a housing facility. A Live Oak building official you see here came with a warning that everyone inside the building had to leave by 5 p.m. There were, in fact, people that were being housed there overnight. Um, the, the certificate of occupancy that is possessed by that business would not allow for people to stay overnight there. Within three days, the business itself will have to be some type of quarantined, and at that point, they're going to send in a cleaning crew to completely uh, clean that area up. And then at that point, they'll be able to reopen for business. The Live Oak police chief says the two people with COVID-19 were moved to this building in Live Oak from another adult daycare facility in San Antonio. He did not name the facility. He says the two people contracted the virus from their roommate who died last week. Do you know why out of all places were they transported to this particular office building? Uh, I, again, I mean, we didn't have any understanding of this until I believe y'all made us aware of it last night. We've reached out to the business for comment. We have not heard back from them yet. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. And Live Oak City officials say the two infected people were taken to a facility for proper treatment. They did not say where that facility was. She had just lost her job amid the pandemic before she found work as a food delivery driver. Tonight, her family now honoring the memory of Destiny Rodriguez after she was killed in a crash involving a suspected drunk driver. Rodriguez's 10-year-old son Noah was at tonight's vigil with a message for his mother 
who would planned to be a makeup artist one day. My mom was a great woman. She tried starting a new life. She was being a good mom to me in like the past. And she really didn't deserve any of this. Police say the 27 year old mother killed Saturday off Martin Luther King Jr. Drive and Walters. Family members say she was on a pizza delivery just moments before she lost her life. Leonel Martinez, a second person who hasn't been identified arrested after the crash. Rodriguez leaves it behind four children. Tomorrow, all public libraries are set to reopen at noon in San Antonio for contact free pickup. Nine locations will offer limited computer use. Here's a list of those nine. Computer access will be by appointment only and will begin at 3 p.m. People will be limited to one hour on the computers to allow for other users and disinfection between each use. Recently, a limited number of libraries were used as cooling centers with Wi Fi. We have that list on our website as well. Meantime, the San Antonio Riverwalk is officially open again. Today, the San Antonio Riverwalk Association announced nearly all businesses on the Riverwalk are back up and running with new safety measures in place. Many have sanitizer stations placed out in front of the businesses. Crews are also increasing cleanings on railings and other touch points. All employees for Riverwalk businesses will have to pass a health screening and have their temperature checked prior to their shift. Tomorrow on GMSA, the pandemic has left some people struggling financially and some people may be tempted to dip into their retirement fund to get by. But you might be digging yourself into an even deeper financial hole if you do. Tomorrow on GMSA, some alternative options that won't set you back thousands of dollars. Well, we were lucky earlier today, at least in a few locations, we had some pop up showers. It was a situation where they came in from the southeast and they dotted the landscape here and there. That was earlier this afternoon into the evening. One shower hit downtown. It didn't hit the airport. No rainfall measured at the airport, but as close as Adkins, 18 hundredths of an inch just east of San Antonio and a pretty average day temperature wise 71 in the morning, 93 in the afternoon. Right now we have 70s and some low 80s, 78 Stinson, 80 right now in Floresville. 77 Pleasanton and Bandera 76 in comfort. When we wake up tomorrow morning, you'll notice the humidity. It'll be muggy and for the most part we will be in the lower 70s, but you get into the hill country, some upper 60s. We'll be back to talk about how much rain fell and where and future rain chances coming up, Myra. All right, thanks, Adam. It was a ruling that barred workplace discrimination reasons, including race and gender. And today's Supreme Court ruling confirmed the same protection extends to others based on sexual orientation. That ruling follows a setback. Just a few days ago, the Department of Health and Human Services rolled back transgender health care protections put in place under former President Barack Obama. CEO of Equality Texas, Ricardo Martinez, says in addition to today's move, there is more work that needs to be done. To ensure that regardless of where I am, um, I am fully protected and I don't have to compromise any part of me to obtain the rights that everybody else has. Later in this newscast, a transgender woman fired from her job shares her reaction and President Donald Trump also reacting to the ruling. A demand for change putting the pressure on Congress tonight. The Senate on the verge of introducing a measure of policing changes. It's expected to be announced this week. This follows the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Meanwhile, the Minnesota House announcing a $300 million economic aid proposal for businesses that were damaged or destroyed in the protests and rioting. The legislation is aimed at lower income neighborhoods that were hardest hit. The White House also expected to take its first step towards police reform tomorrow. It's not clear how strict the executive order would be. We're told it would include an order to set up a database to better track the excessive use of force by officers nationwide. Meantime, another case involving an officer under scrutiny after a now former police officer shot and killed a man named Richard Brooks outside of a Wendy's in Atlanta on Friday night. Officers say he scuffled with police trying to handcuff him, grabbed an officer's taser and pointed it back at the officer as he ran away. He was shot in the back. Atlanta's mayor issuing reform orders for the city's police department. Officers should use de-escalation techniques to gain voluntary compliance and avoid or minimize the use of physical force and to continuously develop, update and train officers in de-escalation techniques. The President Donald Trump called po the police encounter with Brooks, quote, very disturbing. 
Still ahead on the night beat following days of protests here in San Antonio, the first of three community listening sessions held tonight. What was heard during that event and when you'll have a chance to have your voice heard coming up. And the defenders uncover an incident of racism within the department's Park Police Division. Why the handling of this case is causing controversy. Next on the Night Beat. Your voice heard. The San Antonio City Council Public Safety Committee today held the first of three community listening sessions in an effort to gather feedback on the state of policing right here at home. That first session was held entirely online with participants allowed to join in. People who wanted to share their thoughts and put forth ideas were given two minutes each to speak. I am requesting a transparent line item, line item budget for SAPD to be released to the public. I am also requesting that the city of San Antonio reinvest in public safety by defunding the police and redirecting those funds to housing, health and human services. When community programs are not funded in favor of militarizing our police force, the only result is criminalization of poverty and the brutalization of communities of color. People were also allowed to comment on the city's website. Many of those comments were read aloud during that session. The next session is set for Thursday and will be held in person. The location and time can be found on the city's Facebook page. Is San Antonio now into week three following protests over the killing of George Floyd? As calls to reform or even defund SAPD mount, the KSAT 12 defenders have uncovered an incident of racism within the department's Park Police Division that has not been revealed to the public until now. The night team's Dylan Collier on that controversial punishment for the supervisor at the center of all this and why some people are calling for his removal. It happened August 15th at Travis Park after a park police officer broke up a disturbance between a Hispanic man and a black man. A supervisor identified as Sergeant Michael Burns in these records provided by a source responded to the scene and told the officer the situation reminded him of a joke. Burns then said out loud, quote, why can't a Hispanic and a black have an interracial marriage? After the officer answered why, Burns replied, quote, their babies would be too lazy to steal. While the officer who heard the joke did not report Burns and in fact later said he wasn't offended by the joke, another one did. Added to that complaint, a second Park Police Sergeant, an African American, was informed that Burns recalled telling the same joke in front of him and that it had his approval. The sergeant told Internal Affairs all of that was untrue and that he had never been and would never be okay with a joke like that. How, how do we progress from here? The incident doesn't sit well with Jordan Joe Parks or Matthew Alonzo, two activists Don't shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! who have been a constant presence since last month among San Antonio protesters demonstrating against police brutality and in favor of wide-scale reform within SAPD. Ultimately, the, the biggest issues that, that we deal with is, is a, a lack of trust between the SAPD and the people. Racist jokes are, are, are not and should never be told and are never funny, especially while on the clock, especially in a position such as that. For, for being it isn't the first time racism has reared its ugly head within the rank and file. Bike patrol officer Tim Garcia was fired after his own body-worn camera two summers ago captured him repeatedly directing a racial slur and profanities at a suspect at the River Center Mall. Garcia, through an arbitrator, had his termination overturned and reduced to a 10-month suspension. That's 10 months longer than Burns, a former deputy chief under Chief William McManus, who retired from SAPD in 2011, then unretired and joined its Park Police Division three years later. Burns' punishment for the racially insensitive joke, a simple written reprimand, a document the public and the press is normally not allowed to see. I 100% think that he should have been pulled from duty. District 3 Councilwoman Rebecca Villagran just last week suggested new officers be given lie detector tests to see if they have racist ideologies. Villagran telling us on the phone the Burns incident is exactly the type of behavior she wants rooted out. And quote, this shouldn't be accepted. These are our public facing jobs. They need to be building trust. 
Parks is calling on SAPD to make Sergeant Burns' entire personnel file public to see if he has a history of this behavior. So with the momentum that we have right now, I don't think that that's something they want to fight us on. Mayor Ron Nuremberg has attended several of these protests. We attempted to sit down with him for this story, went back and forth with his spokesman before finally being told that Nuremberg would not be made available. His spokesman did want us to know that the mayor opposes racist language and behavior. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. And Dylan tells us the Defenders also reached out to SAPD to request an interview with Chief McManus Thursday, then Friday, over the weekend, and again on Monday. A department spokeswoman responded she was unfamiliar with the incident. Burns remains with the department. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. 80 degrees out there. Saw a little bit of rain. That was nice to see, but the humidity, that's what's making its way back in, Adam. That's what's really noticeable out there. Compared to what we had last week and over the weekend, the humidity's back, and it takes humidity to make some rain. And But well, we got really lucky today with a little change in our pattern, and a few showers popped up. Let's get right to it with a look at our KSAT Connect, which is the photos you can submit through our KSAT Weather Authority app. And you look at the skyline of downtown on the right hand side of your screen and then that big rain shaft on the left hand side that was the big downpour that moved through downtown earlier today now castorville great view of rainbow earlier today there's one shot and then look at the vibrant colors there and that nice view in castorville that was actually between lacoste and castorville and you can see the double rainbow the secondary rainbow very faintly but on the right hand side of the screen there and that's when the order of colors is actually reversed than the primary rainbow. So sometimes if you get a really crisp secondary rainbow, you'll be able to see that reversal of colors. Anyway, in terms of rainfall accumulations today, some folks, well, we're pretty fortunate, especially you get down to Atascosa County, just around and south of Pleasanton, some good accumulations here. And then you get just east of town, particularly in Lavaca County. I had confirmation in Shiner from John of an inch of rain in his rain gauge. Just northwest of Hallettsville, along the Lavaca River, a rain gauge measured one inch of rain. And then radar estimates just south of Hallettsville of 3.2. You get around Quero estimates of about an inch. So pretty good rainfall east of town where the moisture was thicker and those showers were heavier. Here's the shower that moved through downtown. It came in along 87, clipped Lavernia. Adkins with 18 hundredths of an inch and then passed through downtown before it dissipated as it moved on into the Holotus area falling apart. So we were lucky today. Some of these showers popped up along the coastal plain and a few of them made their way to the I-35 corridor. What we could really use though is a good organized system that would bring us widespread soaking agriculturally significant rain. That's not in the works right now. We do have the big blue H overhead. It's not necessarily a strong upper level high, but it's enough to close the door for many good disturbances. This upper level low over the Carolinas, that would be perfect for us, but unfortunately that's not going to be drifting our way as the upper level high remains strong enough just to deflect all the activity and keep it out of our area. So rain chances tomorrow, 10%. Then we get into the upcoming weekend and we're looking at a 20% chance. So a few more of those pop-up showers here and there, but nothing organized. Right now, some 70s to lower 80s across South Texas, 82 Carrizo Springs, 80 at the airport in town, and you get up to Fredericksburg at 75, but it's the humidity, dew points well into the 60s. So we are feeling that mugginess and it's gonna remain in place the rest of the week and really for the foreseeable future, which is normal for this time of year. So tomorrow we'll start the day with some low clouds at 71 degrees, maybe a passing sprinkle early in the morning. Otherwise, a 10% chance as we get into the afternoon for a little downpour to develop. All right, so not as widespread as what we had today. 92 degrees, the high temperature with a mixture of sun and clouds. Wednesday and Thursday really looking dry. Could be a few coastal showers popping up, but generally very dry, still warm, low to mid 90s. Then this weekend we'll have that 20% chance as we welcome astronomical summer, the solstice at 4.43 p.m. on Saturday. All right, thanks, Adam. Astronomical summer. <laughs> Officially. There you go. All right, a bit of a mystery at a San Antonio school tonight that Greg Simmons has solved. We have breaking news, and it involves Burbank football program, a tweet that went out shortly before 9 tonight, and I can tell you it is COVID-19 related. It is not at the school. When we come back, Burbank activities have been shut down for the rest of this week. We've got details when we come back. 
and Zeke tests positive for COVID-19. And he's not the only Dallas Cowboy or Houston Texan for that matter. Coming up. A very alarming tweet tonight for the Burbank Bulldogs football Twitter account at about 845 this evening. It reads, attention all Burbank athletes. At this time, strength and conditioning camp has been temporarily suspended. Until further notice, please check Google Classroom for updates. We apologize for the inconvenience. Stay safe. That tweet has since been deleted, but according to San Antonio School District spokesman Leslie Price, the tweet went out tonight after a coach was exposed to someone he believes has a coronavirus over the weekend away from school. That coach is now under quarantine, and in a separate incident, a student athlete was also exposed to someone believed to be with a coronavirus, also not on school grounds. A student did not attend today's team activities, and neither is tested positive for COVID-19, nor has any other student athlete or coach at Burbank. Out of an abundance of caution, all team activities have been canceled for the rest of this week. As a result, Burbank is believed to be the first school in San Antonio, if not the state, to shut down strength and conditioning since all student athletes were allowed back on campus June the 8th. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. A small number of both the Dallas Cowboys and the Houston Texans, including star running back Ezekiel Elliott, have tested positive for the coronavirus. That's according to Zeke's agent, Rocky Arsenault, who spoke to the NFL Network, but says Elliott is feeling good. None of the players have been at the star complex, with one player reporting flu-like symptoms while others were asymptomatic. Due to federal and local privacy laws, we were unable to provide information regarding the personal health of any of our employees, the Cowboys said in a statement, but added that we are following all CDC, local and NFL guidelines to keep our facilities safe, including limited employee access. Right now, the NFL is only allowing players who need rehab to be in the team facilities. The University of the Incarnate Word has announced that interim athletic director Richard Duran has been officially elevated to the permanent role of athletic director. In doing so, Duran becomes the youngest sitting Division I athletic director. Duran took over as AD, interim AD, back in August of 2019 after Brian Wickstrom abruptly resigned without explanation. UIW President Dr. Thomas M. Evans made the announcement today during a Zoom meeting with reporters. As interim AD, Richard has demonstrated his willingness to work with all campus partners, not only for the benefit of the athletic department, but for the university as a whole. He showed us his ability to lead, his dedication to his staff, to our student athletes, and to our UIW mission. Nothing's gonna change. We're gonna to continue to, to operate in mission-oriented um, way for the university and continue to push our coaches, our staff, to provide the best student athlete experience possible. And we're gonna to continue to rally support from you know, our ticket holders, our sponsors, our donors, because, it, because of their support, it's how we're going to continue to grow the athletic department. And I'm very excited about the future. The university is now working on getting their student athletes back on campus with the target date right now set for July the 6th. Student athletes are welcome back at both Southside and Sam Houston High Schools next. As we welcome back high school student athletes to campus, we visit with the Southside Cardinals today. They're coming, welcoming back their athletes at Cardinals Stadium after finishing last year 7-4 overall, 4-3 and three in district. Their goal right now is to be ready to kick off their season at home on Friday, August the 28th against Eagle Pass. But right now, they're just happy to be back on the practice field. It means a lot. You know, we missed all spring ball. We, we're a school that has spring football, so it's very important to us. We've missed three months of basically doing uh, nothing together and now we come back the state's giving us a chance in UIL and our school district to to have these workouts and we're trying to take full advantage of it and doing it the safe way we got sanitizer everywhere we got social distancing coaches a little it's new now I'm not tell, I'm not gonna lie to you it's different but it's 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 better than what we had which is nothing I'm I'm just grateful that we have the opportunity to get out here and work so since we're back in everybody's happy everybody's working hard trying to make a difference next year so the energy like the energy we bring like there's a lot of people showing up every every four set that we do everybody's loud every every transition everybody's loud every time we do something amazing everybody's loud so the energy we bring in is pretty amazing all right with student athletes being allowed back on campus we also visit with the hurricanes at sam houston high school today after finishing three and seven overall hurricanes did manage to go three and three in district 13 5a division one and now working their way back to getting ready to the start of the 2020 season on friday August the 28th in Divine. A lot of this was getting them acclimated. So uh, that first week was slow and steady and making sure that all the procedures are met. 
uh, and that and we're keeping the athletes safe. It's important. It's very important. Like we just getting our chemistry back together and just working out and uh, trying to win district championships and maybe go to state. That's hopes. We've been out here grinding, getting in shape, and just everybody coming together and participating like we're supposed to and being a team. It's just been great. All right, good to have them back. And, of course, we're going to stay on top of this breaking story involving Burbank High School where all their team activity has been shut down the rest of this week. We emphasize that no one has tested positive on campus or either the coaching or student athlete staff for the COVID-19. But out of an abundance of caution, they're shutting down for now. All right. Thank you, Greg. You got it. San Antonio dealing with the second wave of COVID-19. When is the wave expected to peak and is there a third wave expected? Our KSAT Q&A with the president of UT Health San Antonio. Up next. The pandemic far from over, according to health experts, at least 21 states and Puerto Rico seeing a rising number of COVID-19 cases. Texas has hit a record number of hospitalizations. Restaurants opened up to 75% capacity last week, but now officials in Houston are considering another stay in place order after some workers tested positive for the virus. Meantime, the FDA has revoked emergency authorization for two malaria drugs hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, saying they're unlikely to be effective in treating the virus and could cause serious side effects. The President Donald Trump has for months said he's taking hydroclox, hydro, hydroxychloroquine. I knew I'd get there eventually. He's been taking it himself. I took it and I felt good about taking it. I don't know if it had an impact, but it certainly didn't hurt me. I no feel, I feel good. The FDA going further, saying the drugs reduce the effectiveness of the drug remdesivir when given together. The number of cases are, is rising and UT Health San Antonio putting out a warning and a reminder to all of us during this pandemic. Dr. William Henrich, president of UT Health San Antonio, joining us tonight to answer some important questions. First of all, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Talk a little bit You're about welcome. what UT Health is seeing and in terms of the rise in cases and what your models are predicting right now. I'll be happy to. As you know, we have a number of models that have helped us and guided us with regard to planning for hospitalizations and for preparing for COVID-19 patients. We're obligated to keep a certain number of beds open in case there is a public health emergency related to the virus. Now these models are only estimates. They're just guesses, but very educated guesses as to what's happening. They're based on the number of cases, the number of tests, and so forth. Uh, and what we're seeing is a spike in cases in San Antonio, and frankly, in all the big cities in Texas right now. Back in March, April, May, we had a little bump in our case cases. I mean, it was serious, but it was largely related to nursing homes and jails, and we didn't have much community spread. But now what's happening is we're getting a lot of community spread and the number of cases is increasing. Uh, you may remember we had 3,000 COVID positive patients at the beginning of June, and today in the middle of June, we have 4,400. So you can see how rapidly we're increasing, and it's a cause for concern a cause for some uh, alarm. And uh, I think what we should do now is, uh, what I'm urging everybody to do is return to being really careful about mask usage, personal hygiene with your hands, and staying out of crowded environments, especially crowded environments indoors. I've been getting a lot, you know, people interact with us, of course, because, you know, we deliver the news every night. And a lot of people are saying, well, there's more testing. So, of course, there's going to be more positive numbers. But that's not the only thing that you're looking at, correct? That's correct. I mean, there are two things that have happened in almost simultaneous way that I think you both know. One is that we've seen more testing. So that's a factor. But the second uh, factor beyond the testing is we've opened everything up. Gradually, 25% occupancy, 50% occupancy, 75, 100% occupancy. Stores are more crowded. And if you go to the grocery store and just walk around, I'm seeing just by estimates, by crude estimates, about half the people wearing masks. Whereas back in April and in May, 
I would say that 90% of people were wearing masks. So it's the fact that we have what I'll just refer to as COVID virus fatigue with regard to our social interactions that we've let our guard down. And the way we can fight back, the way we can get back on this horse is to use masks and to return to what thwarted the virus in the first place. And I hope everybody will, who can hear this so uh, we'll, we'll do that. Well, it, it, but even more beyond uh, what you're talking about, it's, it's the hospitalization rates that also are causing some concern, correct? It is true. You know, the whole problem in Seattle when it first hit this country back in the spring and in New York City most recently, which is vividly etched in everybody's mind, is the fact that the medical care system can be overwhelmed if the number of people who come to attention in a hospital need specialized care. What that means is the number of available ICU beds, the available experts to treat the patients, the number of respirators that may be needed, all can confound our ability to take care of the population. So the whole idea is to not reach that threshold. So there's plenty of latitude in the system, some flexibility so we can take care of other patients. You know, one thing to remember about this whole episode is that heart disease, diabetes, cancer, strokes, dementia, all the diseases that we usually are focused on are still there. And so we wanna leave plenty of room to take care of those individuals and not have to squeeze the system with all of these infected COVID-19 patients. You talk about how there is that fatigue out there, and I certainly see that when I'm out and about, people are a lot more complacent than they were several weeks ago, and how this is really not a natural way for us to live. It's not natural to be have your face covered all the time. Coming back from maternity leave, I wanted to hug a lot of people around the office, and you, know, you have to restrain yourself, but you're talking about the rededication to all of those things is critically important, and because it has worked. So explain what we need to rededicate dedicate ourselves to as we're seeing this surge? Well, first of all, I share the frustration that you're experiencing uh, as a grandfather, not being able to see my grandchildren is an oft repeated tale in this time. We just had Memorial Day in just a couple of weeks, we'll have the 4th of July, and then we have Labor Day. And if this model is correct, it predicts that somewhere in August, we'll see a new peak and to thwart that peak, to blunt that curve, we need to do three basic things. First of all, we need to reposition ourselves with regard to mask usage. Everybody should be using a mask. They're very effective. Even a surgical mask that's like this is very effective. Wear a bandana, put a handkerchief around your nose, do something that interrupts this process. They're very effective. Secondly, uh, we should return to the meticulous way we wash our hands and how we touch surfaces, then touch our face and our eyes and our nose uh, and use hand washing and hand sanitizer. And third, and this is probably the hardest thing to do for many segments of our population, I believe we should avoid crowded indoor venues, uh, especially things that are a party atmosphere. And the reason is that that leads to incautious close contact. And what that means is you don't know whether the person you're talking to has inadvertently become infected and is a silent case and is shedding the virus. So you've got to be really careful now. I know, I know that fatigue has set in. I know how tiresome it is, but this is our defense. The good news about it is it works. The, the bad news is it's terribly fatiguing and can can get your spirits. We've seen it work. We blunted, you know, the the April and May uh, April and May numbers. You know, we blunted those numbers. But you've been you've been at UT Health San Antonio since 2009. Have you ever issued an urgent call like you're doing today? No, I can't remember anything uh, along these lines. We've had crises before. We've had a major healthcare challenges before but to me i just i'll say i'm older than both of you and i can certainly say in my lifetime 
I have never seen anything that challenges in this challenges us in this way on so many levels. The healthcare system, yes, but it challenges our very social nature. It challenges the way we live in a fundamental way. And so it's uh, it's going to be something we won't forget. It'll be something that we look back on and say that was rough. But it it is what it is and we have to we have to respond to it with these measures that we know will be successful. Your point's right. If we follow these measures, we'll lower the curve, we'll keep the healthcare system intact, we'll be able to take very good care of the people who get sick and save lives. And if we don't, then we'll be in a, in a place where we'll have more collateral effects from the disease and heaven forbid, we'll, we'll lose more people. And that's something we just, we just can't afford to do. Doctor, should we be expecting a third wave of COVID-19 cases? Right now, without a vaccine and without an antiviral, the prediction is we'll see another spike, hopefully one we can mute in the fall. I listen to the same experts you do, the same experts who are tracking the hundreds of projects, the thousands of projects which are dedicated to either an antiviral that will cure the disease or a vaccine which will prevent it. And if you're on the optimistic side of those reports, the uh, best prognosis for us is somewhere around the turn of the calendar year, we'll have in our hands a vaccine that can be mass produced and that will be effective. And hopefully before then, we'll have an antiviral which will save lives and prevent the serious illness, the pneumonia, which has uh, killed people. So that's the time frame. But right now, until we know until we have proof of those two things coming to light, what we have to do is do what we can do to protect each other. Using this mask is a sign of respect and caring for everybody whom you meet. And everybody, in my view, uh, wants to make sure they don't, they don't have any people get sick from inadvertent spread. So use the mask and pay attention to what you can do. Absolutely. We can do this together. We're all in this together. So wear those masks, social distance, hygiene. So important. Dr. William Henrich, UT Health San Antonio, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. It was a worry for many in the LGBTQ community. Despite having the right to marry, could they be discriminated against at work? The U.S. Supreme Court making a historic civil rights ruling today. ABC's Inez de la Catera with more from Washington. It's being hailed as the most consequential Supreme Court decision since same-sex marriage was legalized five years ago. The U.S. Supreme Court ruling today that LGBT Americans are covered by the same anti-discrimination laws that protect their heterosexual colleagues in the workplace, meaning they cannot be fired or discriminated against simply because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Individuals involved in the case include Gerald Bostock, a child welfare services coordinator in Georgia, who says he was fired after he joined a gay softball league. Donald Zarda, a skydiving instructor who was fired after telling a customer he was gay. And Amy Stevens, a transgender woman who lost her job as a funeral director after she revealed her plan to transition. I'm overwhelmed with joy and, and I, my heart is filled with, with gratitude to the justices to my wonderful legal team my my great family and circle of friends my partner and all those great organizations that have been by my side the landmark ruling was a 6-3 decision with the court's four liberal justices being joined by conservative chief justice john roberts and the majority opinion written by another conservative neil gorsuch Gorsuch citing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was meant to address the problems of race and gender discrimination, writing, only the written word is the law and all persons are entitled to its benefits. No, they've ruled. Uh, I've read the decision and some people were surprised, but uh, they've ruled and we live with their decision. That's what it's all about. We live with the decision of the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, an attorney for the funeral home that employed Amy Stevens called the decision disappointing, writing in a statement that redefining sex to mean gender identity would create chaos and unfairness for women and girls in athletics, women's shelters, and many other contexts. 
Inez de la Quatera, ABC News, Washington. Break from the humidity was nice while it lasted, but we knew it wasn't going to last forever. Yeah, and we've got what the summer solstice is that what's coming up? That is coming up. Okay. Yeah, shortly before 5 p.m. on Saturday, so astronomical summer. I say astronomical because meteorological summer starts June 1st. Uh, they go by the actual calendar date, and it's for record keeping purposes and whatnot. So, anyway, high temperatures today 93 degrees here in San Antonio. After morning low of 71, but no rainfall at the airport. We had a shower just south of the airport, but nothing right over the rain gauge there. 97 for the high in Del Rio. We made it to 91 in Kerrville and 93 Beeville and Carrizo Springs had a high of 95. Alrighty, let's take a look at the conditions out there right now. We're at 78 temperatures not falling off as quickly this evening as what we had in previous nights because of the extra humidity in the air. Dew points up to 67. So that even makes it feel like it's two degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Looking at the readings across the state, no big changes, no big differences. North, south, west to east, even all the way up to Plains. I mean, North Platte's at 84, Omaha's 81, and we're at 78 in San Antonio. Midland's at 82 degrees, still hanging on to 83 in Laredo and Carrizo Springs at 81. It looks like a few reporting sites haven't been uh, have been actually reporting uh, throughout the day today, so I'm not sure what the deal is with Del Rio and Eagle Pass, but they've been blank out there today. I'm sure they'll get back up and online again soon. Dew points are up. Here's one of the big changes. Dew points are about 5 to 15 degrees warmer now than this time yesterday, and that's because of that wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico. That breeze has made it muggy out there again. I mean, look at these deweys well into the 70s. That is thick humidity. We're feeling it. It's typical for this time of year. It's what we'd expect. And it actually helped to generate some of these showers that we had out there, especially just east of I-35. Now we still have the big ridge that's poking all the way up into the Great Lakes states here. Big blue H, but it's not an especially strong upper level high. So it's not gonna be pressing on us and really warming us up a lot. We're looking at 71 degrees tomorrow morning, 85 at noon, and then 92 the high temperature. So a lot like what we had today, which is average for this time of year. And other than some morning clouds, I think we'll have a decent amount of sunshine into the afternoon. A 10% chance of some pop-up showers tomorrow. And then Wednesday and Thursday really just looking dry and sunny. We get into the upcoming weekend, and that's when we have that 20% chance that's back in the picture for the afternoon hours, both Saturday and Sunday. A little bit of pop-up activity can't be ruled out, but unfortunately nothing good, nothing soaking, nothing organized. And there it is, Steve, Saturday, 4.43 p.m. Summer solstice. Setting my alarm. Right. Astronomical uh -huh. <laughs> summer. Astronomical summer. Right. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Coming up, an update on the massive cell phone outage you may have been dealing with, what the Federal Communications Commission is saying. Up next. The Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, is launching an investigation following an outage that may have impacted your cell phone. T-Mobile tweeted that its customers were experiencing service interruptions when it came to calls and text. Other carriers claim their customers were also impacted when they tried calling someone who had service with T-Mobile. A reason for the outage hasn't been given just yet. The chairman of the FCC says, quote, we are demanding answers, end quote. Service tracking site Down Detector reported that at its highest point, more than 100,000 customers reported outages in the U.S. By this evening... That number had fallen to about 25,000. Saw some complaints on Facebook about that today. Researchers continue to try advanced phone technology. We were able to get texting with 2G technology. 3G allowed us to surf the internet with our phones. 5G is what's next. But what exactly is that? 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz explains what the hype is all about. Mama? You've probably seen the commercials singing the praises of 5G, but what is it? 5G will be a game changer because in addition to faster data speeds, it lays the groundwork for more advanced uses like autonomous vehicles and smart cities. That's a ways away, but initially 5G allows for much faster downloads for videos, games, and music, up to five times faster than 4G or LTE. And 5G can handle more devices at once, so you won't have to worry about bad service in a crowd 
crowded place. So where is 5G and what do you need to get it? 5G networks are still being built across the country. For now, the bigger carriers offer it in many major cities, but some smaller ones too. Locally, major carriers have begun to roll out 5G. Coverage areas and speed should increase in the coming year. But unless your phone is compatible with 5G, you'll have to get a new one that can handle the new faster technology. Phones that support 5G include the U.S. versions of Samsung's newest flagship phones, the Galaxy S20, S20 Plus, and S20 Ultra. LG, Motorola, and OnePlus also offer 5G models. But if you're an Apple fan, you'll have to wait, likely until this fall. The company hasn't officially announced plans for a 5G phone. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. All right, this was a dream come true for a boy in Arizona. Three-year-old Tyson loves garbage trucks. He's so fascinated by them that his mom thought the perfect birthday present would be this. She invited the Scottsdale City Solid Waste Department to stop by the house for a surprise. Tyson got to look inside the truck with the neighborhood trash collectors. <laughs> learning all the bells and whistles. Oh, this is so familiar. Full yeah. on sprint to the front window at my yeah. house on garbage day. Gotta see the big something, truck. Something about boys and trucks. I love them. <laughs> Have a good night.